Hey guys, welcome to another edition of Simply Fit. I'm your host, Sandy White, your number one health and wellness cheerleader. And you guys know we're on a mission to save 1 million lives by encouraging individuals to live a simply fit life through health and nutrition so that they're able to overcome suicide and depression. And we wanna thank WYTV7 Christian Broadcasters Network for allowing Simply Fit to be on their platform for the third season. Guys, we could not do what we're doing right now and be exposed to the plethora of individuals without their help. So if you guys don't mind, do me a huge favor, go to our website, wytv7.org and check out all of the wonderful things that we're doing in the community. And while you're there, click the donate button so that you can continue to see wonderful broadcasts like this one and as well as all of the other ones. So today I... Um, we have a really special guest on. Um, Pastor Elizabeth Stone is here. I am sticking with um, uh, suicide prevention um, because that's that's coming up soon, the Suicide Prevention Month. And we wanna make you guys seriously aware of what to do, all of your um, strategies that you can use to help yourself or maybe a loved one that's going through uh, challenging times. And so, I want to tell you a little bit about um, Pastor Stone because uh, she has written a book with her daughter, basically going walking walking through the steps to just save as many lives as what we're trying to do. So we're partnering up with as many individuals that have the same mission that we do that we have, so we can save as many lives as possible. Now, uh, Pastor Stone has she's an author, she's a speaker. And I already mentioned she's a pastor, like multiple times, guys, and she's an advocate. She's traveled from Philadelphia to West Virginia, my favorite place, France, and now she's uh, located in Kentucky. Um, she's connecting people with the Bible for faith, life, and their calling. And she's using biblical truth for life, and she shares hope through faith and empower believers to know and understand God's giving their, their God-given gift and their vocations. And so with, the, and, and in a process of that, she co-authored her current book, which is Valley of the Shadow with her daughter, Erin. So we want to, I invited her here so she can talk more about her new book. Again, the, the strategies that, but that her and Erin came up together um, to help you guys and, and or your loved ones. So with that being said, let's welcome Pastor Stone to the show. How are you today? I'm well, thank you so much for just, uh, letting me participate with you. I'm so excited about your goal of saving 1 million lives. I mean, that is just super specific. And I think that's the way we have to think. That's kingdom thinking. It, it is. Um, and, and suicide is, and depression, that's a, that, that's a crippling, nasty, for lack of words, spirit that's in our earth that we need a lot of soldiers out here training individuals to realize that you can win this battle here. You, you don't have to let your gifts and your talents be stolen by Satan. So tell me, um, cause I saw that you traveled a lot. So were you um, just out doing missionary work or were you a pastor prior or was it a combination? Like, tell us how you got into all of this. Well, I have a very checkered background. Um, I was raised in Philadelphia, go Eagles. And um, I really uh, love Philadelphia area, but I started um, my educational career in Bethany, West Virginia, which is a tiny little Disciples of Christ school in the Northern Panhandle of West Virginia. And when I graduated, um, I had a split certification of mathematics and French, which is very weird, yes. Um, but I started teaching in a tiny little mountain school. And I taught for a few there, years there. And I met my husband who works for the Department of Agriculture. He's also a pastor. And um, it was one of those country boy, city girl type things. And uh, we got married and because he works for the Department of Agriculture, we've moved around a lot, but I kept teaching. Um, I taught math and French for about 15 years. I taught in a school for pregnant and parenting teens for about five and a half years, which was a residential facility. And I, um, when 
I finished my work um, in West Virginia and we moved to Kentucky, somewhere in there, there was a transition and I felt the Lord calling me to full-time ministry. I started out as a commissioned lay pastor, just doing work as I could get it. Um, but then I went to seminary right there in Charlotte, North Carolina. I went to Gordon Conwell and graduated in 2015. I was one of the few grandparents among the students and I'm very proud of that. And um, then I was ordained and actually started working. Um, I While I was in seminary, I actually pastored two churches in rural West Virginia. And uh, when I graduated, I kept working with one of them. And then when we moved to Kentucky, I got a new church. So I'm really excited about what the Lord's doing, but kind of the under uh, undertone of all this uh, was in 2007, my daughter attempted suicide. Now, Aaron was, uh, you know, I was reading the statistics today, 54% of people who attempt or complete suicide have no prior experience of or um, indication of mental illness. And that's how Aaron was. I mean, she was the model, perfect teenage daughter. Um, she is uh, bless you. She's number four in our five children. And uh, she was part of her youth group. She led Bible devotions at her high school. She was popular. She was in the choir. She was on the tennis team. I mean, she was just super involved in everything. And we thought everything was going well. Um, and she uh, one night had a crisis and she took over 100 over the counter um, medications, things you probably have in your cabinet. And I'm the one who found her. I found her the next morning. She was lying in her closet and she was supposed to go to a big national retreat that day. And I found her lying in her suitcase uh, that she had been packing and she was babbling and incoherent. And the suitcase was full of her clothes and pools of vomit. And I called my husband and he scooped her up in his strong arms and we went to the hospital and we were not sure that she was going to survive. We spent uh, the next couple of days just praying her through. Um, her brothers came from Morgantown where they were in college and our youngest daughter at that point was 14 and we just came around Aaron and we prayed for her and gathered as a family and the Lord was very gracious and she survived and it is a miracle. She should, she, first of all, she probably shouldn't have survived, but if she survived, she should have had damage to her physical body and she doesn't. Um, she's completely perfect and healthy and uh, we are very blessed by that. But our journey back was a long one. So the way I got into this was by experience. And uh, that happened in 2007. In 2014, we published our book, Valley of the Shadow which is the only one we have out currently. And it's available on our website, which is valleyoftheshadow.org. And um, it basically is our journey and our story, um, our testimony. And the biggest reason we wrote it was because we found that uh, the church didn't know how to deal with suicide. The church didn't have resources. Now the world had a few resources, but um, the church had even fewer. And when I started looking for resources, the only thing I could find at the library was a 1000 page book from Harvard Medical School. And I mean, it just, where do you start with a thousand page book that's written by medical professionals? I needed something for us. So the first thing we wanted to do was start the conversation. Um, because if you can't name something and talk about it, you give it power. And as you say, there is this spirit of suicide. And this is what the enemy wants to do. The enemy wants to rob and to kill and destroy. And uh, we, we are on a mission to get people to start the conversations. Uh, one of the things that I thought when this happened to us was that we were unique, that there weren't very many people in the church that were um, suffering with the, a crisis of suicide. But what I found out was when I started talking about it, there were a lot of people like us and they had just gone into a silent little space and were hurting without any healing. And I believe that Jesus came to the earth to give us life and to give us healing. So that's how we got started. 
I love that. I, I, and you, you had a lot of good points um, that you made. One, and I'm going to try to, to, guys, we only have 30 minutes. So we have to ask the Pastor Stone to come back or we will. But one of the things that you hit on is most, most churches don't have a resource. Um, I would just say like, maybe just a couple of years ago, and I'm at one of the largest mega churches here in the DMV, and we just started um, our mental health um, month where we have different seminars and physicians and uh, clinical uh, psychiatrists come in there. It, it, and, and the thing is what uh, a lot of churches are starting to work on is to let people know it's not taboo anymore. You don't have to be ashamed. You need to take care of your mind like you take care of your teeth, your eyes, every aspect of your body. Some people take care of their cars better than they do themselves. So I'm glad you um, mentioned that. So one of the questions um, stemming out of that, that you didn't with your church find any resources, um, were you guys out of your research able to put together something that churches in the area that you're in that they can start following? And do you go and help them maintain that? Or how is that working since there were no resources? Well, um, what we started doing is we did uh, seminars for clergy and church leadership. And uh, we were getting some really great traction on that in West Virginia and having um, some really good responses to that. And then COVID hit. <laughs> and so um, our in-person seminars have kind of been put on the back burner. Uh, what I am really hoping to do with Aaron's cooperation is to create an online on-demand seminar. Because uh, in this climate, uh, I mean, I am... I am hoping and praying we're going to get back to normal. I really am. But if we don't, I don't want people to be in the situation that I was in. And, um, you know, when this all happened, um, I was still a commissioned lay pastor and I called the pastor of my mother church and told him what had happened. Uh, we were at the hospital with Aaron and I said to him and I told him that she had taken all these pills and that she was unconscious and not responsive. And he said, I'm sick. I can't come today. And I was, I just felt so abandoned. Now I will say he did repent and he came and he said a little prayer and walked out, but he never followed up again. He never called us back again and never found out how we were doing. And so I know now that I have been in pastoral work since 2002 and my husband has been in it even longer. If somebody calls you and somebody's in the hospital, you drop what you're doing and you go, you know, you show up. That's probably the most important thing. And even if you don't know what to say, just being there is the impo most important thing. Um, so we have, kind of developed. Um, I do have a, a one sheet that um, I'd be happy to share with anybody. If you go on my website and sign up for my email letter, um, one of the things that I send out and it's called the Compassionate Christians Toolbox. But one of the things that we have discovered is that people treat a death by suicide differently in the church than any other, um, than any other death. And the first thing I would say is that if somebody in your church completes suicide, and we like to say they complete suicide, because when somebody's in that dark place of suicidal desperation or suicidal depression, um, we don't consider them competent to commit to something. We like to say they complete suicide. So if somebody completes suicide, Sometimes the church doesn't do the normal stuff. Now, I, you know, I don't know about you, but my, I've worked in Appalachia my whole life. And, you know, if there's a funeral, my golly, the women of the church are in the house, cleaning the house and taking care of everything. And if uh, and people bring in meals and when you go to the service everybody shows up. And when you go to graveside, everybody shows up. And after graveside, you all go back to the church and have a bereavement dinner. Well, sometimes what happens when there's a suicide, people think, what do we do? What do we do? And the answer is exactly the same stuff. We as a community of faith need to come around that family 
We need to listen to their stories, just like we would listen if the person died of a heart attack. Um, we need to share that burden with them and allow them to recover. And uh, you need to call them the day after the funeral and you need to invite them you know, to do whatever, come to a church meeting, go to a movie, go bowling, whatever it is you do to make sure you're still connected. And sometimes you'll have to go and pick them up and drag them to something because they are in a dark place, but we don't want what we call suicide contagion. You know, when someone has completed suicide, sometimes there is this tendency of the despair to spread like poison. So um, my first bit of advice of, to every church is do exactly what you would do. And with a mental illness, it's the same thing. Now you have to get permission because it's a delicate thing, but it, you, know, you would never tell somebody with cancer, oh, just pray it away. Or somebody with, with diabetes, just put on some Christian music and you'll be fine. We need to get to the place where we are resourcing people. And I am so excited that there are now fine Christian counselors out there. And there are medicines that are available that weren't available 20, 30, 50 years ago. So we've got the resources. The question is how can we as a church coordinate ourselves, have those resources at the ready and share them with people before it gets to that, to that place, so. Oh, that is awesome. And, and um, <clears throat> guys, if you know someone that themselves or a loved one that's having suicidal challenges, please dial the um, 800-273-TALK number for the National Suicide uh, Hotline, because this is a serious subject matter here. And we will continue this um, right after our commercial break, because I have a lot more questions. And I know um, Pastor Stone has some more uh, suggestions and tips that she would like to share with you guys. So stick with us and we'll be right back after the quick commercial break. Swing Into Their Dreams Foundation presents the golf tournament of the year, raising scholarships for aspiring national golf club in Milton, Georgia. The inaugural HBCU Swing Into Their Dreams Charity Golf Tournament. Registration and gourmet continental breakfast begins at 8 a.m. and shotgun at 10 a.m. Award reception follows. Come enjoy a day of jazz, mimosa, cigars, cash bar, silent auction, and more. For more information, contact 770-686-7143. Don't miss it. Welcome back, guys. If you just if you're just joining in, I'm Sandy White, the host of Simply Fit, and we just took a quick commercial break. So I hope you guys enjoy uh, Swing into the Dream. And we have a special guest with us today, um, Pastor Elizabeth Stone, and we've been talking about suicide prevention. So if you know someone that's suffering with this debilitating. Uh, disease, please have them or yourself, have them go to the National Suicide Hotline, which is 800-273-TALK. So with that being said, uh, I know we don't have a lot more time and I'm going to try to crunch in like four questions into one. And if you get to all of them, great. If, if you got to come back, great. But let's see what we can do in like the second half of the show. So one, you were talking about how um, you are able to provide spiritual responses to, um, uh, it, you were starting off on that, spiritual responses to suicide in the church because um, they didn't have any resources. And um, if you can continue on that and maybe tap into how, um, how, how um, or so suggestions for the church and the family to help pe practical things that people can work through when they're having um when they're in that dark space. And then the other one is um, the uh, the resources for the church to combat suicide, um, better things uh, other than what we've already discussed and some tips and strategies on where people can find um, these resources if their church doesn't have it. So we don't have a situation like the one you explained where the, the pastor just didn't know what to do and he just ignored it because that, that it doesn't go away. Oh, you're right. It doesn't go away. And uh, one thing that I want to explain so people understand what suicidal depression feels like. 
Um, if you've ever been to an amusement park and you go into the Hall of Mirrors, okay, and you pay your money and you go in and you walk in one mirror and it makes you look as skinny as a toothpick, and you maybe go to the next mirror and it makes you look all wavy, and maybe you go to the next one and it's all kind of split and changed around and you look like a Picasso painting. Well, that's... Um, you are in a mirror house of mirrors and you know you're in a house of mirrors and you walk out the other side and everything's normal again. But when somebody gets into suicidal desperation or uh, depression, they are getting messages that are lies. These messages distort their image of themselves and they're stuck in that hall of mirrors with all those wonky mirrors and they look at those images of themselves and they say, that's what I look like. And the one thing, um, if you read my book, the one thing that startled me so much um, when I read my daughter's portion of the book um, was that she thought she was worthless. And um, if you have ever met, uh, you know, a young lady that was more worthwhile, I can't imagine it now. I mean, I realize that we're all God's image and we all have worth. But how could she get into the dark place where she thought she was worthless? So I think the first thing we have to do is start building layers around ourselves and around our kids. And I, I'm particularly sensitive about the kids, but we also have a whole group of veterans. Veterans account for 20% of suicides every day. How can we build community around people? And it's a, it's, to me, it's multi-circles that interact. Um, isolation is one of the biggest causes for suicidal depression and desperation. So family circle, very important. Extended family circle, very important. Um, church family, very important. And these things should be overlapping and interacting. But then when you're talking about kids, they might have you know, a school circle. They might have activities that they do or an athletic team they belong to, the more things that can tie them into a place and to people who will give them the narrative that they are worthwhile, the more success we will have at defeating this thing. Isolation is one of the most significant factors. Now, um, you can also see a lot of times, um, if you see a young person or an old person, anybody giving away their personal um, belongings, things that are super important, that's a sign. If there's an increased use of alcohol or drugs, that's a sign. Personal hygiene goes away, that's a sign. And sometimes when someone has made the decision to complete suicide, there will be a brightening all of a sudden they'll seem very cheerful because they've made their decision. And that is another like 11th hour warning flag that somebody might be thinking about doing this. One of the things we need to do is we need to get willing to ask the questions. You know, sometimes people go through a long period of hard things and problem after problem after problem hits them. Um, and there's nothing, you know, it's not their fault. Um, you know, I can remember a month years ago when we lost two of my husband's grandparents and my dad and two of my kids had pneumonia. And I mean, by the end of the month, I was standing in the basement with tears running down my face saying, Lord, I need a rescue here. I need a rescue. Well, if people have no resources, then that is when they get into a danger of being depressed and depression untreated can lead to suicidal desperation. Uh, the other thing that I would say in addition to that is asking and just seeing if you see somebody going through a hard time, you know, hey, you know, you've been going through an awful hard time. What is it that can, I can do to help you? Or um, have you thought about suicide? Have you thought about harming yourself? And some people say, oh, well, if you say suicide, they'll get the idea. But that's statistically wrong. Statistically it doesn't increase their chances of completing suicide if you say it out loud. And if you say it out loud, they might say, here's, here's somebody who can help me. And um, the 1-800 uh, number 273-8255 is uh, linked in to a lot of different places. When you call it, you will get somebody local in your own community. Plus, if you're a veteran, you can push one and you will get a veteran to talk to. So uh, we have a lot of really great uh, resources that are beginning to come more and more. 
our, our national um, legislators and senators have voted in an emergency number. It's not active yet, but by uh, July of 2022, you'll be able to push 988 and get straight to the suicide hotline. So things are beginning to move. And that's really good. I mean, because a lot of times people do feel like they are just simply alone. They feel like there's no safe place. They feel like I'm the only one going through this. So I'm glad you touched on all of that. And, and again, if you guys know anybody that's having suicidal challenges or you're going through it yourself, you're not alone. You can reach out to Pastor Stone. She has the, um, what is that? You said the uh, comp compilation Christian toolbox. Did I say that wrong? Uh, I, the compassionate Christians toolbox. And it's, it's just a one sheet. It has like statistics on it about suicide. And then it has just a few, just a few things just to give you something to hang your hat on. You know, I, I think the biggest problem is we get to the point where we're, we're feeling like we're swimming in a sea. And uh, one of the things I love so much about your ministry is, you know, just do one thing at a time. Just what can you do right now? Just, just to, have some little bit of action you can take right yeah. now. And um, I will tell you the three most dangerous things. So uh, if someone, the first level is if somebody's having thoughts of suicide, just general thoughts of suicide. And they say that uh, at any given time, 12 million adults are having suicidal thoughts at any given time. Um, that, that's not necessarily uncommon. Uh, but most people can move past it. But if they go to the second step and say, well, if I was going to complete suicide, how would I do it? And they have a plan for doing it. And then the third most dangerous place is if they're thinking about it, if they have a plan and if they have the means to hand, you know, so, oh, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about suicide. I think I'll hang myself and here I've got a rope and a, a bit of scaffolding. You know, when you're in that situation where they are telling you they have all three things, you take them to an emergency room or to their counselor or to their doctor. And it is not a bad thing for you to say, I can't, I can't give you the help you need, but I can get you there. And that, and you know what, even though you, the statement that you just made, if you were talking to someone that went, that, that told you all three steps and you said, I can't help you, but I can get, I can get you some help. That's a lifeline right there. Not mm -hmm. because you're starting a conversation. You're not just leaving the person hanging like, oh, well, sorry, not my expertise. And because people don't care. And I say this all the time. People don't care how much, you know, they want to know how much you care. And something so simple as, you yeah. know what? Sally, let me just get you to the emergency room because that, that's over my head, but I'm not going to leave you here by yourself. And they may put the person on a 72 hour uh, mental watch or whatever the case, but it's a start on the conversation and it's getting them the help that they need. So, you know, we, we're almost down to our last little bit and I have been enjoying myself with you, but I want you to take a little bit of time to tell people how they can reach you uh, again about the toolbox kit and um, about the book real quick before we run out of time. Okay. Well, um, the best way to reach me, I am on Facebook. Um, the name of our ministry is WV Livingstone Ministries. And that's because I was in West Virginia and didn't anticipate moving to Kentucky. <laughs> so, you know, the Lord's laugh on me, but if, but I kept it because that's easy. So um, we are on Facebook. Um, we have a page for our book, Valley of the Shadow. We have our, our website is valleytheshadow.org. And we actually have two websites linked. Um, so when you go to valleyofshadow.org, don't worry about what pops up, but you'll see my picture and you'll know you're in the right place. You can get a copy of our book there. And I will say it's a personal testimony. Okay. This is not as much a how to as to what our journey was and how we came through it. And there's some, a lot of tips in there and everything, but we want other people to resonate with it. And, um, we are on, uh, I'm on Facebook. I'm also on Facebook every week when I preach my sermon for Stanford Presbyterian. Um, and you can look that up on Facebook. And so, um, and if you go to our website and if you email me through the website, I will get back to you and, um, we will, we'll talk. And if I can't answer your questions, 
I know other people who can. Uh, this is something that we've done mostly through experience. And I'll tell you, sometimes I have tried to walk away from this thing, but the Lord just keeps bringing it back to me. So here I am. And the other thing I, I would uh, just say um, real quickly is that um, you're not alone and that God loves you and cares about you. And you are worth so much that the blood of God was shed for you on the cross. So never, never think that you're worthless. Never think that there isn't a whole heaven full of love waiting to help you. Amen. And you all got 72,000 angels just, just wait, waiting for you to give them some commands. So we want to thank um, Pastor Stone for coming on. We've had a beautiful time talking to you. I want to remind you guys that I'm Sandy White, your host of Simply Fit, your number one health and wellness cheerleader. We come on at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on uh, the uh, WYTV7 Christian Broadcasters Network Station. And so until next week, we'll see you later. Bye. Bye-bye. Thanks so much.